Okay, that concludes my comments for today. <laughs> uh, it's always difficult to um, talk during a lunch and learn because I learned that you shouldn't eat and try to talk at the same time. So enjoy your food. Today we're going to talk a little bit about the rites of passage. My name is Rick Hill. I'm a Tuscarora. My mother's from the Tuscarora Nation over in New York, and my dad's a Mohawk here from Six Nations. But the rites of passage, if if I can get this to work right. Does it matter how you were raised? Does it matter the things you see when you're young? The words that you hear, the stuff you see your parents doing? Is there a difference between somebody who's raised on a cradle board, like the cradle board on the, uh, the far uh, right, versus somebody who's carried in one of these plastic baby frames? Well, I think it does, because what our ancestors said, in order to be Haudenosaunee, you need to understand life in a certain way. You need to experience things in a certain way. You need instruction from them. So I've tried very hard. <clears throat> I have 12 children all together, and I carried each one of them on a cradle board like this uh, when they were young. I don't know if it did any good, but I figure it's better than not. So rites of passage are the things are society or culture does to help young people understand their position in that society. But there's things that happen even before then. We have a tradition that says you look to the earth to see the faces of the coming generations. They're like in the ground they're, they're, and they're coming up towards us. So it, it makes you wonder where did they come from? How did they get in the ground? We'll discuss that as we go through. So that's the first thing you've got to realize is that at one point you were actually in the earth before you were born into this world. You're already seeing things, you're already hearing things. Every time somebody dances, you hear that, you feel that vibration. And so the womb, your mother's belly, is your first environment. You're surrounded by water. You'll hear your mother's voice. If your mother dances, you'll feel all of that. So you're already becoming familiar with the life you're about to enter. Does that make sense? Now, if you're listening to rap music or your mother's dancing to heavy metal, you might end up being a different kind of person. But let's not talk about Taylor. No. <laughs> so, and the concept is you become a different kind of being once you take your first breath. So we were all born. <clears throat> Usually when I was young, the doctor used to pick you up by your feet, slap you on your rear end to make you cry because you were living in water and then you have to start breathing air. So your first rite of passage is saying, are you going to stay in this world by breathing? Keep breathing. And so that's because we say air, the breath, that's like the creator's breath. He's giving it to you to make you come alive. And then there's these words of welcome that we give. It's, a, it's kind of a long speech. Usually in one of the native languages, I understand you're studying Mohawk, is that right? So when my one daughter was born, we had uh, this uh, woman deliver this speech in Mohawk, in Ganyageha, because we wanted the, the first words that my daughter to hear were in the language welcoming her to this world. Because that didn't happen when I was young. I dare say it didn't happen when my parents were born, so we're trying to bring that back. I found this old speech in the records uh, here in the community, and basically it says that you're connecting the birth, the child, to her mother, to her grandmother. You're also recognizing the father and his family, and it says you're born here on purpose, the whole world is here to provide what you uh, need and that we hope you stay here a long time. I have to tell you, I wish somebody had said those words to me when I was a baby, those first words of welcome to this world. Instead, what happened? The doctor picked me up, slapped me on the rear end, and I started crying. I've been crying ever since. <laughs> <coughs> and then, so we have some beliefs about some things. One, as you know, there's a cord connecting you to your mother. So you have to cut that cord. That in itself is like a rite of passage. You're, you're no longer feeding off of your mother that way. And there's a little bit of uh, the cord that kind of hangs on, dries up, and then falls off. So we used to bury that cord, and it depends. If you were a boy, we would bury it, they say, uh, kind of at the edge of the woods, or some people would say uh, by the uh, wood pile, meaning that boys are supposed to be the good providers, the hunters, the gathering things, taking care of your family. So you're burying it to remind you of that. If it's a girl, they said you would bury it near the house or near the garden. 
because that's what a girl is probably going to end up growing to do. So that's kind of neat when you think about it. Now, a lot of people just throw that away, but when you think about it, it's part of you, part of who you are. Just like your hair and your fingernails and your skin, so it was buried in a special way. And then we have this great uh, tradition of uh, providing a name. Now, in the old days, uh, you would get your name from your clan mother. You would be a, a young uh, baby. Sometimes they would give you a baby name, which is like kind of a nickname. And then as you kind of oh, reveal who you are, so like about your age, they might give you an adult name. It says, now this is what we see in you. But that naming is important because what the clan is saying, you belong to us. We have this relationship. And it's actually kind of neat because they'll, they'll stand there and they hold the boys and they'll sing this song. A man will carry this boy. And basically then they're saying, see this little baby? This is going to be his name. From this day forward, everybody refer to this, this uh, little boy by that name. That's an introduction from you to your community. <laughs> uh, so there's also this tradition about the first tooth that you would lose. My daughter, who was uh, seven, she lost some of her bottom teeth, but she just lost her two uh, top teeth. And so that's a certain time when things began to change. Your thinking begins to change. How many people remember when they lost their first tooth? I just lost my two teeth uh, this morning. They were fake teeth, but I lost them, but I found them again, so that's, I was able to put them in. <laughs> so the loss of the first tooth, they say, some people would say, you take that tooth, you throw it in the woods, or you throw it over a cliff, you return it back to, the, to, the, to the, where things grow out there. Because we are of nature, remember? We came out of the earth. So as things come off of you, you put it back into the earth. The Onondagas have this expression of being under the husk. And what it means is that before boys and girls mature into adulthood, there's a certain period, uh, just probably around your age, when you're considered very special. But you're so special, we have to kind of protect you. We have to help not let you see a lot of horrible things, uh, not hear a lot of horrible things, and not let horrible people come too close to you. So by pretending you're like a corn cob under the husk, protect it, you're still growing, but we're to provide that protection. I dare say that's a big thing because it doesn't happen much anymore, right? I'm, I'm sure some of you, if you were actually to tell us what you watch on TV or on the internet or the things that you hear people say, it might not be too, too healthy, too wholesome. So the idea here is right now you're in your special time of growth that we're supposed to help you develop this sense of yourself. The Senecas believe that you young women like right now, it's uh, getting ready for planting. So they would say, because you're under the husk, it's your job to go out and bless the field before we plant the corn. Because you're young, you're supposed to be innocent, you are uh, connected to the earth. So they would ask you to go out in the corn field and um, uh, t tell the field, tell the mother earth, tell the corn, Get, here we are, we're doing this again, so please <coughs> produce this bounty. So you see the kind of power that the young, young women would have to help that. And then once you enter into adulthood, for young boys, you usually see a change in their voice. Uh, the young uh, women would get their, uh, their first uh, moon time. There are ceremonies attached to that, things that you're supposed to do, because that's a very important time when you transition from when you're a little kid <clears throat> to all of a sudden you become a young adult. And in the old days, they would send both the boys and the girls on what I call a vision quest or a dream quest. They would take you off into the woods. They would, uh, you would ha not eat any food. You just maybe have a little bit of soup, a little bit of medicine tea. And you would stay there for two, three, maybe four days until you would have a dream or you would see something. Something would come to you. And usually, that's what we would call today a totem. I don't know, probably some of you have had to an amazing dream, right? Some bird or some animal comes to you, and helps you, or some person. That's why I believe in the old days they made pipes with these figures on them. So imagine somebody dreamed about this character on the top. It looks like he's got cat ears or this bird. So as you're smoking the pipe, that animal or that totem is looking back at you because that becomes your protective symbol. We have our clan symbols, but we'd also have these here. So acquiring protection is this rite of passage. You have to find ways to protect yourself. You have to have something that helps you ward off all of the darkness that's gonna come your way. <laughs> and then in the old days, we would have a group of old 
men and women, when you have a dream, you would take it to them and they would help to interpret that dream. Because that's very important. How many people remember their dreams? How many people had a dream last night? Right? Actually, we all dream, but some of us don't remember our dreams. Sometimes we dream, the same thing will be happening. Right? What our old people would say, that thing is trying to tell you something. So you need help from somebody to interpret what that dream means. So part of your rite of passage is learning your dream has a sense of destiny or where you're headed to. So there's things you have to do in there. It doesn't mean you're going to win the lottery, you know, or you're going you're to become a super lacrosse player, but there's something there, something that has to be taken care of. And then they would uh, help you, as you see, calling your mental, how well you think, your emotional, and you keep track of uh, the, your uh, emotional health, your spiritual connection. All of that can be upset if you don't fulfill your dreams. And the Senecas have this tradition of actually training in you young guys. They would take actually kids, uh, little boys a little bit younger than you. They would go off with their uncles and the um, men who have um, experience in fighting and they would raise them how to be a defender of your people. So that when you get to be a young man, you know how to do that. You think about it, how did our ancestors learn how to fight so well as they did? They fought in many wars. Not that we were supposed to fight, but it's important that they learn how to do that. Well, it's because they were trained how to do that. Trained to be physically strong. So lacrosse became one way in which you trained a young man how to be agile, how to be mobile, and how to be a little hostile, meaning that you have to be ready to defend yourself. You may never see fighting, but there's always somebody, and it was on the Seneca Nation, their job is to protect the Confederacy. So there was always young men who would be there. Uh, this last line here, they talk about a man without mercy, meaning there's sometimes when you have to call a man forward to do a task and he can't have any emotional um, misgivings. So when they send him to do that task, he, he does the task. And uh, sometimes that can be kind of difficult. And the other, then another rites of passage, after you become an adult, uh, you uh, might fall in love. <laughs> now in the old days, remember we were a clan-based society? So let's pretend each table is a different clan. Here's our clan mother over here. If this young guy shows an interest in a girl over in the other clan, she would go talk to her clan mother. So what do you think about these two getting together? She understands him. The clan mother over there understands her, her, uh, her daughter. If the clan mothers agree, then they'd say, okay, let's let them get married. If the clan mothers don't agree, say, you know, he's just not right for her, it wouldn't happen. Sometimes the clan mother may come to you and say, guess what, you're gonna end up with this woman over here. So it's like an arranged marriage. That was a long time ago. And, uh, but it's really two clan families then becoming united. So they would tell all your clan relatives now, he's going to be with this woman over there. And so you have to have good relationships between their clans. <laughs> In the old tradition, you can't marry within your clan. So you can't pick somebody. If you're a bear, you can't pick another bear to marry. You have to pick somebody else. And then there's this great instruction at the wedding. And what I like about a traditional wedding is they talk to all of the relatives. It's not just the, the bride and groom making vows. Yes, I'm going to love you forever. You know. Instead, it says, it tells the family, the clan mother has a responsibility, your mother has a responsibility, your father has a responsibility, your aunts have a responsibility to help make this marriage work. Because nothing can destroy a good relationship but gossip and rumors and um, relatives who interfere. So everybody gets their instructions about how to help, and then they give a little string of wampum beads. You have to hold them, and you're making a pledge to the Creator, I'm going to work as hard as I can to make this marriage work. And then you see how they're, oh yeah, they have these two baskets. At a traditional wedding, uh, the bride brings a basket full of cornbread, and the groom brings a basket full of uh, um, uh, venison, deer meat. And when you go up to greet them, they give you some of that, because the deer meat represents the man is going to be a good hunter, a good uh, gatherer. The woman's going to be a, a good cultivator of corn. So together, corn from the women and the meat from the, uh, from the men is what uh, symbolizes a good marriage.
Notice there's no cake in that. But like all things, <clears throat> sometimes it doesn't quite work out. You need some help. This again was where your clan mother comes in. She's supposed to provide you advice. So let's just say you're having some difficulties in your relationship. She comes up and she has the strings of wampum and she explains to you and get, encourages you to remember how you felt about each other when you first got together. Remember the pledge you made to each other on this wampum. And remember that in coming together and probably making children, you have a responsibility now to make sure that their children grow up well. So they're always trying to, to encourage you. If it turns out, no matter what you do, it's just not going to work, then they would say, okay, maybe it's best to separate rather than argue and fight. Because we believe in peace, but we also believe in trying to honor our commitments as best we can. And then we have this tradition, I call it making things right. When you get to be <clears throat> uh, an adult, eh, sometimes you don't always do the right thing. Sometimes you goof up. Sometimes you make a mistake. Sometimes you might have hurt people. So one of our rites of passage is when you then stand up in front of all the assembled people and acknowledge the things you've done to cause harm to others. And you make this pledge that I'm not going to do that anymore. And that's very important, especially for uh, you uh, young men. You know, we're supposed to treat men, women or girls, women, uh, uh, the good way. But if things happen, you have to stand in front of everybody and acknowledge the harm that you've done. And this makes it right between the Creator and you, between you and that family, because you're, you're realizing, yes, you're being honest with yourself and with each other. That helps for you to be responsible and dependable. We also have this three sisters wampum. This is when women start disagreeing. They would bring out this wampum. They said one time there was these three sisters who couldn't get along. And in fact, were so upset with each other, they couldn't even, they couldn't even sit at the same table. So there was this old woman, she invited them to over to her house independently. Like, you come over to my house, you come over to my house, you come over to my house. But she didn't tell each other the sisters were going to be there. So they all arrived at her house and right away they got mad, they were going to leave. And she said, wait, wait, wait a minute, I'm going to talk to you. She said, because your disagreement is disrupting the peace in our community. She said, let's go outside, let's go out in, in the garden, take a look at the garden. So they go outside, see their garden growing, she says, tell me what you see. They said, we see the corn, beans, and squash growing together. And in being together, they actually become stronger. And this woman said, there's your model. Three sisters, you have to learn to get along together. But we're going to watch you for a while. We're going to use this wampum string. And as you can see at the bottom, there's three long strings. I think I have a close-up of it. There's two sets of long strings. You're going to make a new pledge to honor your sister, to be helpful. If you kind of mess up on that, we're going to take some of these white beads away. And the one string, it's all a, a separator. We're going to have to have another gathering here because we have to have people get along. Now, I know you're kind of young there, but you know, you may see that in your own family. Maybe your mother and father don't get along with their brother or sister. And you don't want to live that way. You need your family. You need to have good relationships with your family, but you also have, have to have peace among the women. Uh, as they say, happy wife, happy life. <coughs> the other thing that happens, and I'm sure some of you have faced this already, there can be some very hurtful things that happen, particularly uh, the loss of a loved one, the suffering grief. One of our rites of passage says, we're not going to let you sit there and suffer by yourself. We're going to do something to uplift your mind, to bring you back to, um, you could say, a normal position. And they do this by wiping your tears to help to remove all of those things that are uh, not allowing you to see how good those life is. They uh, clean out your ears so you can see how comfort, or hear how comforting our words are. And then they also then clear your throat so that you can have a healthy body. Imagine if you suffer grief. Just say, say one of your grandparents passed away. It really, it's really hurtful. Or somebody you know got killed in a car wreck. It's very depressing. The grief adds up to you. If you keep letting that pile up, you're going to be a very depressed person. What this says, we need you to be healthy, so we're going to try to do this to help you recover from the grief. My dad used to say, we all have to realize one thing. That you're born to die. Sooner or later, though, you are going to die. Nobody lives forever. But our culture says that that passage into the sky world is actually quite a beautiful thing. 
when you're going to leave this world here and part of you is going to begin to journey back onto this. And they say that journey follows the Milky Way. Now it's really getting harder and harder to see the stars in the constellation, but check it out sometime this summer, uh, particularly when the stars are bright. Look for the Milky Way and you'll see this, this cloud of stars and think just for a moment. There's where everybody who lived on Earth walked up to the sky world, back to where we believe our life came from. And that's kind of neat. Eventually, when you pass away, we believe you're going to become a star. So all of those stars that are up in the sky, that's everybody who lived here before. And so when you do get lonely, or you're, you're depressed, I would say, go and look up at the stars. You ask your relatives for some help, they're all there. And that's what's kind of, uh, it's kind of uh, interesting to me, it kind of uh, <clears throat> gets you connected to them. But when we pass away, our bodies are put into the earth. Some of our people believe there's, there's like a spiritual essence to the body. You put that in the ground and it stays here. I call it here your mind soul. Think of it, your mind has a power of itself. Your, part of your soul goes back to the sky world, but the other part stays here and it becomes part of the earth. The reason why we bury people in a traditional ceremony, you don't put them in a concrete uh, crypt or metal casket. You make it so it all decays to join the earth. This can be a little freaky, but think about that. Everything that once lived decays and becomes the soil. And what happens from there? It then produces new life. So right now, this time of year, we're seeing the plants come up again. Pretty soon the crops are gonna come up again. So what our ancestors said, it's the spiritual energy of all of our relatives whose bodies are in the ground helping to make that happen. So you think about that, the next time you see this little plant coming up, next time you see this little flower blossom, realize there's people at work making that happen. And they're making it happen for you. And I think that's, that, I don't know, I like that. I think that's pretty neat. So this journey through life <clears throat> and all of these traditions that take place. So I mentioned there, then we talk about from birth to the naming, to being under the husk at puberty to marriage, making things right to death. And then it kind of starts over again. So remember what I said in the beginning? You look to the earth to the faces of the coming generations. Where do they come from? I'm not sure. Is it because we put the bodies of our relatives in the ground? They get kind of, I don't know, recycled, transformed? Because then it goes from the ground through the mother's body into this world. But this cycle continues on. So I think it's important to uh, remember that, to realize that we're all connected to this great thing. <laughs> Anyway, that's a very brief view of what these rites of passages are like. Now, we don't all do all of these things. And we don't all do them well, and we don't agree on them all, but it's something that's important. So imagine when you were born, somebody gave you some words of instruction. Now you're just a little baby. Does the baby understand that? Well, we say yes, because even before you're born, you understand things around here. I'll tell you this, uh, we had uh, my last three girls were born at home, and right now they're uh, three years old, seven and um, 12. And while my wife was pregnant, they said, um, well, Rick, actually both of you are pregnant. I said, what? I kind of know I look a little like I'm pregnant, but uh, <laughs> she said, you both have to be careful about what you see, what you hear, and what you say. If you want that little baby who's growing to be healthy, you can't be projecting negative things on it. But you know what that meant? I had to stop watching TV because there's so much violence on TV. There's so much swear words on TV. There's so much negativity on TV. And it was a little rough for me, you know? So unplugged the TV. Don't have any harsh words at home. That can be a little rough for me too. It's hard sometimes because I was raised by an iron worker, well, both my wife and I, you know, and sometimes it's a little easy to swear but we had to be careful of our language. We had to be careful of what we watched. I, I, they said I couldn't go hunting, and I love go hunting. I said, well, why, how come I can't hunt while we're pregnant? They said, the last thing you want to see is you're cutting this belly of this, this creature open, you reach in there and you're pulling all of their guts out and your hands are all bloody. Why wouldn't you want to see that when your wife is pregnant? Because then it could project how the delivery is going to go. Does that make sense? So you want to see good things, 
You want to think good things, you want to say good things, you want to be a good person. Because that's the parent's responsibility to try to ensure that this baby's born into this good world. <coughs> I learned that when I was um, <coughs> a lot older than you. So one thing about a rice of passage, these are lifelong learning. Things will happen. There's other things, say like with your young guys, you go hunting the first time you go hunting, the first time you could kill a deer, we'll say, or an animal. There's certain things some people do. They take the liver and you actually have to bite this liver because it's very nutritious, but it can be a little weird. Cut that animal open, pull that liver out, chop it off and chew it uh, raw. But that's what our ancestors do, is strengthen you. Now that's been the old days when the deer were healthy and pure. I'd be a little suspect of trying to do that, especially if you're shooting deer in Hamilton. You, know? and you might want to you might want to get that checked out with a with a biologist. But it's things like that that we can do. Even if they haven't happened in your life, now is the time to start thinking about that. Now is the time to ask your teachers, try to find other ways of doing that, because now rites of passage are um, going to school, graduating from school, getting your license. Getting a divorce, no, so <laughs> whatever, whatever these things are that we do, <laughs> we have to find a way to restore some of these other things so that you can grow up to be a good uh, indigenous uh, person. For those of you who aren't Haudenosaunee, your ancestors will have similar traditions. You should find out what that is. Because if you haven't experienced it, you might want to think about that. You might want to plan something for yourself. So I think that just trying to give you a sense that it was all important in the past because that's what made our people who they were. When we stop doing these things, things change, right? You grew up then like me. I didn't know anything about my tradition growing up. I didn't know anything about my language growing up because my parents were just making a living. My dad was an iron worker building buildings. And I've learned since then, remember my first slide? How you grow up matters. But the other thing I learned, you never stop growing up. Even at my age here, when my hair and my teeth are falling out at an alarming rate, I'm still learning a few things about that. So does anybody have any questions about all of that? Or anybody have a story that relates to any of that? Yes. So um, I've heard stories about there being multiple clans in the same clan. Like I heard that there's three or four turtle clans. Yes. And the same with bear and yeah. wolf. So, would that be like the same plan? Yeah. Even though they're different, right. would that be the same? Well, uh, we found some old records in Washington from a fellow who collected um, stories from here in the 1880s. And there was one page there that talked about that. Because in reality, we have 49 different clans. And it's true what she said. So among the Mohawks, you have three bear clans, three turtles, and three wolves, that they're different clans and that it's okay for, for that suckling bear to marry a, um, a mature bear in the old days. Because it also makes sense. You're talking about a small Mohawk uh, village, you know? So somehow we've kind of uh, made it so you're not supposed to marry anybody of your clan, but in the old days, I think they would have thought a little bit differently about that. And then we also have people who've married other natives from other clans, and they exist within their society. But our tradition is based upon following your mother's clan. So um, I think that's why, it, that's why the clan mothers though, because see the other thing about, let's just say we are bears and there are turtles over here. Our, some of our young people may be interested in them, but they could also be our blood relatives. So that's why the clan mothers have to get together and say, no, you're too closely related uh, on your father's side or your mother's side, even though you're a different clan. And um, then you have to learn how to get along and how to cooperate with people. So the rite of passage is really about becoming a mature person, to be responsible for yourself, to have good relationships, and to conduct yourself in such a way that makes your family proud of who you are. And so I think that's why it's important to do all of these kind of things. Anybody else have a question or a comment? <laughs> yes. I got a comment. Um, just a question you talked about all the plans. Uh, I was told that you're not even supposed to marry anybody on your clan side. Yeah. So if we know in each, in each uh, community, the clans are divided into two groups. So some people would say that, uh, that you don't even look at your, your, think of them as your like brother or sister clans, you'd have to look across to your cousin clans for that. 
but because now we have 16 different communities and we have you know, a dozen different longhouses, some people at one community may say something very different from what I'm saying here. And that's the hard part. You have to get connected to a place, get connected to a longhouse, and then you abide by the things that they say within that. If you start going around window shopping, you, you, you will get very confused. And what they do in this longhouse is different than what they do over here, so it can be difficult. But I think the real thing is taking the time to slow down, to develop a relationship with somebody that you can trust. Uh, because sometimes we're so focused on all of the other things about clan, about this and about that, and if you don't have a good relationship, it's not gonna last anyway. So taking the time to develop it and uh, being careful, I think is very important. So sometimes I, I advocate with my, my girls that uh, I'd rather see you with somebody who's going to treat you well and respect you than worry sometimes about too close a clan relationship. Uh, but that's just me, you know. <coughs> Anyone else? Another idea? Yes. Yes. Is it happening anywhere right now? Yes, well, there's a, there's a group here at Six Nations, at Aquasasani, I'm not sure anywhere else. But the difference is, see, it comes from the Onondaga term that applied to kids before they uh, uh, reach puberty. Today, it's applied to young adults. So, uh, so the concept's the same, but you can see where there's a difference. If you're dealing with young kids before they uh, uh, go through puberty, that's when they most need to be protected. Uh, but because we don't do that, they've kind of now applied that to just how do we help young people. But being under the husk meant, just like that corn kernel, you know at uh, what we call um, green corn stage, yeah, you can eat that corn and it's full of nutrition, but it's not fully matured. So we leave some of it in the field to become mature. I think it's the same way. So imagine that corn seed. If you pull the husk back too early, you'll, you'll destroy the corn. If you leave it on too long, it can get a little moldy. So it's all really about protecting the thinking and the, um, how do you want, the spirit of that young person, which I believe we have to get back to. And there's a lesson in the sky world. Some people call it um, downfended, where you have a young person protected, where you, you're putting this cattail down all around them so that you know if somebody's come too close to them. So the question is, why do we have to keep people away from young people? It's because they're so susceptible. Oh, I'll tell you another one, this might kind of scare some of you. They say because young women are like that, that young girls shouldn't go to lacrosse games. Because lacrosse is what? It's full of male testosterone. That's like a man's world. It's just all of this stuff flying around. And if you're too young, you'll be too susceptible to that male energy. Now, I tried, to, I tried to tell it to all my daughters, you kidding, they would listen to me, you know? Dad, I want to go to that lacrosse game. And something about lacrosse sweat that gets to them. But anyway, so, <laughs> so some of our traditions were a lot stricter than we apply them today. And it's hard sometimes to go back and resurrect some of this. Anything else? Anyway, I hope this has been a little bit helpful for you. It hasn't confused you too much or scared you. There's things that just uh, our ancestors used to believe and do, some things we still do today. So I appreciate you uh, uh, paying attention, staying awake, and uh, we hope you have a good uh, life on uh, your journey. Things turn out good for you. So, yeah.